So, hello everyone. Um, so we are here to talk about containers on bare metal and the preemptible servers. Um, we are from CERN and SKA. So my name is Belmiro. I work at CERN in the cloud team. Um, John. Hi everyone, my name is John Garbett. Um, I'm currently working at Stack HPC as a principal engineer. Um, I should be clear, I'm talking on behalf of myself. Um, I'm not, I sort of work as a subcontractor for the SKA, but I'm talking about some interesting things that are happening. Um, so I suppose I was gonna give a little background to myself. Um, I started in uh, working at OpenStack in December 2010, about that time frame. Done lots of interesting things. Um, been very lucky with the people I've managed to work with. And I, so I started working on the Nova project. Um, I've been Nova PTL in Liberty and Metaka. Been on the TC for a little while. Um, but yeah, currently focusing on the HPC kind of type world. So before we get started on containers and uh, bare metal and preemptible instances, I wanted to start with introducing why we've got people talking about the SK and CERN together on the stage. So quite recently, there's been a, a collaboration between uh, the CERN and the SKA. Uh, we kicked this off and got together and discussed like where we've got uh, common requirements on OpenStack. And an interesting thing is uh, we think today, you know, CERN has got some very big infrastructure, but in sort of the mid uh, 2020s timeframe, um, it's gonna be sort of 50 to 100 times more capacity needed for what's happening. So as, as all the luminosities increase by a factor of 10, it's a really bad scaling factor and you get um, an awful lot more compute than needs happening. And the, the observation was made that, you know, the, S, the SKA right now is in a prototyping phase. So we're looking at what's needed, working with the physicists on what's gonna happen. Um, and over time, uh, the, uh, the SKA, when it goes into production in the mid 2020s, is gonna be sort of similar order of magnitudes as the problem that CERN's looking at. So we got together and looked at what's uh, what's in common. So I'll do a quick introduction to, um, first of all, with what CERN's up to. So uh, let's go first through this slide. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides. This is the universe in one slide. So we are trying to represent 13.7 billion of years in this slide. Um, and what CERN and SK do is trying to understand the universe. This is very which questions. So CERN, what we do there is to try to understand the milliseconds after the Big Bang. Um, so that's why we have uh, all those accelerators and detectors to try to recreate those conditions uh, of the matter in those early milliseconds. SKA looks into all the rest to try to understand all the mysteries of the universe after the Big Bang. Um, so CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Uh, is one of the biggest research uh, organizations. Uh, it was created in the 50s. Um, and the headquarters sits in the border between France and Switzerland. This is a high level view of the CERN site. Uh, and CERN to study um, basically the, the matter as a network uh, of complex uh, accelerators, you see some of them. But the, the biggest one is the Large Hadron Collider. That is a ring with 27 kilometers. Uh, it's in a tunnel, 100 meters underground, and crosses actually the two countries, France and Switzerland. You see uh, in the image the Lake of Geneva, the, the Alps at the end. Um, so what happens is we have this large, uh, particle accelerator, the LHC, that accelerates particles, two beams of particles in opposite directions, and they collide. Um, and when they collide, um, we want to cap that moment. Uh, and for that, uh, we have these huge detectors uh, that are in, in huge caverns, so also 100 meters underground. What they are basically, they are a digital camera. Um, not a normal digital camera. They take 40 million pictures per second. This produces a lot, a lot of data, around one petabyte of data per second. 
Of course, we cannot handle all that, that data, so this needs to be filtered. Um, and after all the filtering, what we save is the interesting events, the new physics, what we think is the new physics, which is worth to, to analyze. And that is few gigabytes per, per second that we store in the CERN data centers. Um, so then, to analyze all, the, all that, that data, the data is distributed around all the world in different research centers. But at CERN, we also have our own clouds, and a lot of data is analyzed there. This is one of our dashboards, uh, monitoring dashboards, where you can see the size of our clouds. So we have more than 300K cores, um, more than 9, 9K uh, hypervisors, more than 4,000 projects, a lot of VMs. Most of these VMs, more than 80% of our capacity is basically to execute and all these jobs from the LHC data. The rest is other projects and also IT services. Okay. So we've been talking a lot about the SKA, and I probably forgot to mention that that actually means square kilometer array. So, you know, we're talking about CERN and everything else. Uh, what's, what, what is this SKA? So here we've got a picture of the... Uh, the radio telescopes. The idea is that there's a large array of radio telescopes that all work together to look further and further back in time, basically by having a better, a higher resolution of picture. So keep looking deep. Uh, there's two, there's actually two telescopes in, in some sense. There's a, first of all, there's one site in South Africa and there's another site in Australia. They're both sort of in the desert, away from where there's all the radio interference. So you don't want to be there with a mobile phone ringing your friends because you might pretend to be some kind of pulsar and that would be bad. So you need to get away from all the radio interference and have a look at that. So the other type of antenna basically looks a bit like some coat hangers that have been tied together and they're about the size of me, you know, about, about my height and they're all wired together. So one's looking at one type of frequency, the other's uh, One's looking at sort of mid-range frequencies and one's looking at low frequencies. So there's two different systems, but they're both connected to a very similar looking supercomputer to process the information. That's what we'll eventually start talking about. But just to sort of describe the flow of what's happening here, there's lots of signals coming out of the radio telescopes. They go into a digital signal processor and that turns them into UDP packets. Um, so it's doing things like from this antenna, you know, what's the difference between all the other antennas, and it sends those UDP packets through the wire across to the supercomputer, then we have to do something useful with that. The scale here is kind of, uh, initially seems quite large, and then gets kind of incredible, <laughs> is roughly the scale. So when you look at the, the pipe coming into the supercomputer on the right-hand side, uh, that's why I've been worried most recently, because I'm closest to that, you've probably got about 500 uh, gigabits a second, oh, sorry, 500 gigabytes a second coming in uh, to the supercomputer in UDP, and you don't really want to drop any of those, and you need to do something useful with most of them. That's an interesting challenge. So let's move to talk about how we're using OpenStack in here. Um, for this particular talk, I'm looking at how we're using containers and bare metal um, for the SKA. And it's a combination of, you know, you've got Nova deployed as an ironic cloud as the driver behind Nova, and you're creating the containers in Magnum, and we're seeing how that all fits together. So before I go into that in detail, I just need to give a little bit more context about what's actually happening inside that supercomputer. What we've got here is a whole load of compute nodes. So the UDP packets are coming up the bottom. And the basic flow here is that you've got a whole load of image data coming in. We need to then write that to storage in a format that's useful. So that's an ingest process. And then a time that's convenient, we then put, we read that out and process it to get the results. And those results then need to get shipped off. So that's the kind of flow 
That's the rough flow through the system. So how do we sort of make this real? It all sounds very fuzzy. At Cambridge University, um, we've been building a prototype for this supercomputer called Alaska. It's currently about, uh, it's currently at two racks of hardware, looking a little bit like this. Um, we've got InfiniBand as a sort of high speed connection on one side, and we've got the 25 gig Ethernet where the, uh, the UDP packets are going to be coming in. But we're trying to basically trying to work out how we can orchestrate this as efficiently as possible. Um, so at this scale, if we start losing one or two percent of performance, that's an awful lot of extra compute capacity that we required. So it, it's, really, it's really important to try and not waste that and put things together as efficiently as we can. So why bare metal, why containers? For this particular talk, I just wanted to go through some properties of the system uh, to make clear why we're going through these choices. Firstly, uh, it's, this system is a special purpose kind of system in the sense there's a single security zone. This is, we've got the telescope, got all the packets coming in these two places. And right now, that, that's, it's a really precious resource to have this big supercomputer near the telescope. So we're being very careful in the workloads and the optimizing what's actually happening inside here. So there's only the one security zone. Um, and because of that one security zone and the real, you know, really focusing on performance over security, we've chosen to go bare metal and target that. A really interesting requirement for this telescope um, that is probably pushing a lot of the, the boundaries of what we can do is that at times there's some very interesting things that happen in the sky where you just want to go and look at them. So say there's a supernova that happens and you want to go look at the supernova, you find that out and you need to drop what you're doing and go look at the big shiny thing over in the other corner. Now, that sounds great, um, but there's some even more extreme events when you look at this uh, sort of deep space, um, very sort of high frequency, well, sort of deep space, big, big signals that happen. There's only sort of like over a decade, I can't remember quite how many, but there are only about five that happened. They happen so far away that the Doppler shift means that we might actually be able to detect them in one frequency somewhere and the globe will turn around just enough to, for it to be available on the other frequency because of Doppler shift. I think only someone was talking about that being a potential possibility. I'm not sure 30 seconds will be uh, quick enough to capture some of that, but that's the kind of things people are thinking about. How do we see that thing in the sky? So. That pushes us to think about how quickly can we deploy Nova instances. And if we're using Ironic, anyone that's watched the BIOS recently will know that you can get a cup of coffee in the time that the thing is actually turning on, which would be pretty bad because the, uh, the nice shiny thing in the sky wouldn't be there anymore. I mean, you might have coffee, which is good, but you know, it wouldn't be much use. So we need to sort of have this, you know, this has to be at the back of our mind, you know, has to be not the back of our minds, it's a really important requirement. The other piece here is that we have to think about how long this system will be in use and what kind of workflows are involved. Um, it's gonna take, we just really, we can't sort of say, we will always run all the workloads on Spark or we'll always use Dask. Those are not options. We need to allow for that kind of choice and flexibility and really sort of make use of modern development kind of paradigms and make sure that we're not, you know, tying ourselves down in that sense. So Magnum with Ironic. When we were looking into this and we started the CERN and SKA collaboration, um, we, we, we sat down and spoke about, you know, this Magnum thing, does that work? And there was lots of nodding from the other side of the table. And so we moved on with that and tried it with uh, Ironic. Initially, wasn't so fun. Um, the originally, until oh well, so most recently in Queens, there's been a big change in that the VM and the bare metal are both using exactly the same code paths. So we're now using Fedora Atomic as the base image for both. Um, so we don't have these awkward conversations saying, you've done some really good work in the VM thing there, 
why is the bare metal one broken? Because it's the same code. And um, it, we just don't get that kind of you know, second class citizen approach anymore. So that's been a big, a big step forward. So going to a slightly different view of what's happening with inside the, um, the current prototype for, this, for the software that's running on top of the, um, the supercomputer, I just wanted to highlight a few of the things that we're having to connect in to the, um, to the physical machine that has the containers running on it. If you remember my original diagrams, I was talking about high-speed interconnects and 25 gig ethernet networks to get the UDP packets. The really important thing this diagram is trying to say is the networks. There's more than one network. And right now, Magnum doesn't actually support more than one network. So what we've done here is we created the cluster with Magnum. And then we've had some Ansible scripts. Well, the Ansible scripts are creating the cluster. But on top of that, they have to go in and add additional ports into the host and then configure those appropriately. So it's, an, it's not perfect. We're going to have to work with Magnum to go through some of these things. But it is possible to have all these three networks attached to your Magnum cluster. So as I was saying, there's problems with the ports, but you can work around them. There's a few little niggles we found along the way in that we, you know, we're using the Fedora Atomic um, version 27. And the version of Docker in there is not as new as people were wanting. So we had to upgrade that. Um, that's when I discovered that uh, RPMs and YUM isn't a thing in Atomic which I probably should have known, but I didn't. <laughs> so uh, I, not that I actually did the work someone else did, but I found out all these interesting things about Fedora Atomic. Um, part of the follow-on of that is we were wanting to have high-speed storage that I was mentioning. We have InfiniBand. There we thought RDMA is a great idea to, do with, to get the best out of the InfiniBand. And that meant updating Atomic with drivers. And again, we hit kind of similar issues. But with some automation to get this sorted, it's not impossible. It's just a bit of a, a bump. Somehow we managed to break cloud in it in the process. <laughs> um, cloud in it's usually pretty robust once it's working, but we made it un unhappy. Um, but luckily, cloud in it's extensible, and again, we're able to work around that for now. Um, something to do with LVM and having to grow the partition in the way that IntraFS didn't fancy. Anyway, with a little bit of help, um, that happened, and. There's loads of interesting details, but if you want to read more, um, have a look at the Stack HPC blog. Generally, just have a look at the Stack HPC blog. When we do things, interesting things, we try to share them with everyone. So it's a good way to keep track of uh, some fun stuff that's happening. So now I've been talking for almost all the talk. Um, I think it's a good time to hand over and talk about preemptible instances. So something that we at CERN and also SKA we are looking for is preemptible instances. So. Let's try first to understand the issue. Uh, it has to do uh, with the resource utilization. If we go to a public cloud, um, we have this illusion of infinity capacity. Because users have a credit card, they need more capacity, they just buy, uh, pay the cloud provider for more capacity. However, for private clouds, scientific clouds like at CERN and SKA, this is not entirely true. Uh, users don't pay for the resources that they consume. So what we use is basically we enforce quotas for each project. This prevents a user to exhaust all the resources in the clouds, um, overcommitting. So we usually don't overcommit resources or even quotas. Um, quotas also allow, allow us to manage individual project requirements. Um, in terms of capacity, in terms of CPUs and RAM that they use, are actually dedicating a specific set of, of hardware to that specific project. Um, and we all have um, services or projects that are more important than others. So we always reserve more capacity, even over provision for those, those um, projects, because they are important. Uh, in scientific clouds, uh, also projects have different funding models. So 
the project re receives the funding, the hardware is bought for that particular project, and the project expects that hardware to be there to be used when they need. Um, so we have all these issues. Um, so, and this I will try to illustrate a little bit, exaggerate a little bit more here, what is the issue with quotas, uh, just to stress for the, the problem. So if we have a cloud with only two projects, um, both have quota. I exhaust the quota in one of the projects. It's easy uh, for the cloud admin, for the managers, to go to the other project and actually allocate more quota to the initial project, and uh, it can continue to go on if it really requires those resources. Easy if you have two projects. If you have a few more, maybe that is doable. Uh, if you have a lot of them, this is almost impossible. You allocate the quota initially to that project, and it's very hard then to allocate more or, or less during the lifetime of that project, because that implies changing the quota in all the other projects because you don't want to over-provision your quota. So at the end, we can have a lot of resources that were bought for processing jobs, for science, and they are not being used because it's very difficult for a project to always have workloads to feed those resources, to process data. Um, but the, actually, this is not only a problem in private clouds. Public clouds have exactly the same problem. They buy a lot of hardware, and they try to maximize the, the utilization of those resources. The way they do it is having different pricing and SLA uh, policies. So if they have a lot of resources available, maybe they um, down the price of the resources that they provide, offering them with a different SLA. Um, and actually, they also have a spot market. So you can request resources, pay less for them, and if someone else re requires those resources, they pay more, they will shut down your, your instances. This is the spot market that AWS and Google Cloud have. In private clouds, um, OpenStack private clouds, we don't have this concept. Uh, quotas are hard limits, um, so what we can do? So that's why we start discussing with the, the Nova team um, and between SKA and CERN, how can we improve this? And we had, we had the idea basically to do what public clouds are already doing, the spot market without market, because our users don't pay. Uh, and these are the preemptible instances. Um, so when a project is host the quota, the idea is they will continue to be able to create new instances with a lower SLA. If the other project um, requires uh, those resources and they have quota and they cannot create because the cloud is exhausted, the spot instances, the printable instances will be deleted. So, a um, few months ago, we started to implement a prototype on this. Um, the idea is to start initially very simple, to talk with the Nova team, to see what is required in Nova actually to, to easy this task. So we have a few specs upstream that are being reviewed, back and forth, um, it's going well. And meanwhile, we are also the, developing our prototype. And the idea starts simple. So what we are trying to do now, and we will deploy this probably soon at CERN Cloud, is we're going to have dedicated projects um, for the printable instances. And these printable projects we will have unlimited quota. So the user that has access to those projects will create the printable instances. When the resources are required, uh, these printable instances will be deleted. With this workflow, um, we'll try to explain that. So we are trying to create an instance. Um, Nova Scheduler uh, tries, to create an, uh, tries to allocate resources, and there are no resources available. So as you know, the instance state changes to no valid host. One thing that we are trying to introduce in Nova, it's a new uh, instance state called pending. 
So your instance goes to pending state, and a notification is sent to a new service, the Reaper service that will be the printable instance orchestration. Uh, that will consume this notification that says no valid host, and uh, two things can happen uh, with this. If you are trying to boot uh, an instance that is not printable, um, the orchestrator will try to delete a printable instance to give you a space for this new instance. So is what we see there. It will delete the printable instance, and the second step is to rebuild your initial instances that is in pending state. If successful, your instances, your original instance is rebuilt, and the and the state changes to active. If not, um, if is if not it is not possible to delete a spot instance because they are any in the system, or because the flavor that we are asking, even if we delete the spot instances, doesn't uh, give the capacity that you need. Uh, your original instance will change to error state. This is the workflow that I just explained. So we are doing a lot of work. We have few specs upstream, some codes. Uh, the initial two bullet points there are two specs that are being reviewed. Uh, the addition of the notification and the pending state. And actually, the, our prototype, you can have a look already in our GitLab at CERN. So if you have the same requirements for containers on bare metal, if you are doing similar work, please contact us, because we may collaborate on this. Uh, if you are interested in the printable instances, also ping us, review the specs, give us your feedback. We are really interested to hear about you. So thank you so much. So we've got 12 minutes left for questions. Uh, there's a clock counting. <laughs> Let's fire away. Oh, we'll, re we'll repeat the question. Preemptable. So, so the, the question was for preemptable instances. Uh, how do you pick which one to? Well, to terminate. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you can have different policies, right? You could be the one that was created first. So the oldest ones will be deleted first. Could be then per user. Uh, could be users with more, that have instances with more priority than others. However, what we are doing now is the simplest case. So it will be completely random. Uh, it's a preemptible instance. The SLA is very low. You know that could be deleted any time. So we're going to start deleting randomly uh, a printable. But it's a, it's, a very, it's a very good question. And uh, in the future, what we expect is to add these policies. And maybe this is a plugin that you can add your own policy. A follow up on this question. So does it mean that all instances in the project are preemptable? Uh, Yes, in the, in the link that I show you of our prototype, yes, that is the idea initially. Um, in future, we expect the, to change that. And you are a user that you have permission to do this. You can create spot instances. So it's kind of a volatile project. Yes. So the, the, it's really just a pragmatic choice right now. Yeah. Um, so that there is a bonus by doing that in that the quotas are per project. So actually, we don't need to worry about quotas for preemptables versus other instances. Um, you can just do that by launching your instance in the other project. Um, network yeah. permissions aside, it, it seems like a good pragmatic choice. There are some work now, quotas um, per resource provider, and that will help to, to move forward there, to everyone use uh, printable instances in different projects. Yes. So we should remember to, re uh, so the, for, to repeat the question. Um, when you kill the, the instance, uh, does it ever get restarted? Um, right now, the, basically, the on kill, it's terminate. 
uh, we were talking, so there's a forum session on preemptible instances. One of the things we tried to, I don't like the name, we need a better name. Um, <laughs> one of the things we were talking through was uh, what's the relationship between um, OpenStack and the, and the server when you delete it. What actually is likely to happen is we'll do a soft shutdown and give the, give the VM um, or, or bare metal for that instance about 30 seconds to go and then issue the hard shutdown if it's not shut itself down. So that's the kind of relationship. So there's no coming back from the dead in that sense. It's, it's actually just killing the, killing the um, server. Oh. oh, there's a question over there. Yeah, it's, yep. so the question was is uh, what happens with the quota? Um, uh, that's a bad summary of the question, but uh, when, you, when, you st when you start the preemptible instances, because it's in a separate project, the quotas just being used quota in that separate project. So, so the, the, the projects that you're launching the preemptibles in could almost have unlimited quota if you're okay with that. Um, but basically the quota in that uh, preemptible project uh, is the, it effectively, it's limiting the concurrent number of preemptibles you can have, if that makes sense. So, you plan to have preemptive instances in the same project, right? Um, that will be a great addition to have preemptible instances uh, in, the, in your normal project. But for now, to be easy to, to, to have a prototype on this, a proof of concept, it's better to, to have a separate project. Yeah, I mean, th there's a lot of different open questions, I think, all the way through this. So I think the, re the real plan here is let's, let's get something working end to end. And we've got pretty, um, it, right now, really, it's just like, what's the minimal integration slash changes as ANOVA to make this whole thing work end to end? And once we get this in production, I think the limitations of exactly where you know, the problems are will lie. Because um, inside this, we're, when we're discussing this, is um, because you're saying it's, the quota, you know, the instances are in this particular project. We can actually use that project ID to to get the information from placement to work out what the candidates are to be deleted. Because obviously, when you're trying to pick what to delete, you have to like, find out what all the uh, preemptible instances are in the system. Um, and right now, you know, a list of project IDs is a, an API we have that we can do that. It's a, an intensive operation because you're doing it for quite a few different projects, but it's uh, it's doable. Um, so once we've got all those in place. We can then talk about, you know, how do we optimize each of those pieces, um, assuming it works out and, you know, people are happy with it. Yeah, but it, it will be great to to get to your requirements. So as John yeah. already said, there is the we had um, other part uh, forum session. We have the other part. If you can go there and put your requirements, what you think yeah. will be the next step, be yeah. great. Yeah, the network ownership is the thing that I'm a bit concerned about. Although whenever we ask people about is that a problem, we just get a, a general. Yeah. Um, so, you know, good to know if that's not the case. <laughs> so, one more question. Uh, it's kind of follow-up for all of these questions. Is there anything to protect abusing like this kind of project? For example, there's a abuser who just wants more and more and more instances, and at the end, nothing's done. Just the old ones are yeah. disappearing. The old yeah. Ones I mean, th there is quota still, I guess. So, it doesn't have to be unlimited. You could just say this user can only ever launch 10. Um, well, we are talking about only one project, but you, actually you can have several projects for preemptibles yeah. and, only, and uh, actually have a defined quota for these preemptible projects. Yeah. So your user will not be able to, to go uh, over that limit that you define. The, the, Wait, so the no. quota is just a limit. Like it's just like, you know, you can have seven instances in this project. So you can you can launch seven preemptibles, but if you launch the eighth preemptible, it won't it'll fail. So you can only do so much. So, I, so one thing was um, when we were talking about this originally, one concern was, can I launch some um, instances that make other people get killed and then go again and then sort of just create havoc? Uh, and the key thing to realize with this is that um, you don't preempt preemptible instances if that makes sense. So when you're trying to launch your preemptibles, they're basically looking for free space. And all the ones that are sort of paid for, for want a better description, using regular quota, they're the ones that all kill a preemptible. Um, so if you like, 
if you have lots of paid for quota and you're creating loads and deleting loads, you would kick out preemptibles, but that's the whole point of the system. So it's not, it, you can't, it, it's not as attackable as it first seems because of that split. Although we could be wrong, so, you know. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. So the, the question is going back to the, the SKA um, work we've got InfiniBand there, um, and the question is, is it is it multi-tenant or not? So so currently we're not doing um, multi-tenant InfiniBand there because of the it's it's kind of a special purpose thing that we don't think that's a problem. Now, one of the things we might find in the prototype is that um, because of the chattiness between certain things, we might want to use partition keys to help with that. I don't know if that's really a thing or not. We'll find out. Um, generally speaking, um, we've been working with other customers that have been doing multi-tenanted um, InfiniBand. Uh, and there's been some interesting conversations around how we do that with secure host and other things. Um, we should definitely have that question, but yeah, it's, uh, th there's some interesting options there. Um, Sean, did you have a question? I was wondering, could you, could other projects in the future hook into that pending space to use it to auto-scale in the cloud, to say, for example, in a triple-O kind of context where I actually find that I run out of capacity in my cloud, I have a tool that I haven't used, and I could potentially pull that in, or that's hard-coded to a specific notification box that can only be used by the external repo. So, um, Sean said with a glint in his eye, there's a pending state here, can I do, it? Can I do fun things with it? Uh, the answer is yes, that's actually intentional. Um, so the pieces we're actually adding to Nova aren't uh, special purpose as such for preemptibles. So the basic idea is when you have your <laughs> one, a Nova operator's favorite error, no valid host, um, that basically what this is, is when you hit no valid host, you go to pending state rather than error and then somebody has to do something else. So the re how you can get out of pending state is two ways. You do the rebuild, if, it's, if we found a space, or anyone could do that, and, or you do a... Um, a reset state. Yeah, a reset state to go back to error, basically. Yep. So a, a thing that I thought about also in a similar way is that you, know, you can actually use it to effectively cube things that you just don't have room for right now. So as a user, if you had that turned on, you could just have a whole load of things in your sort of like pending state and just to rebuild until there's space for it. Or you can have someone, you know, you can always use it as a queue effectively. Um, so yeah, there's some interesting stuff you could do. The notification uh, for context that we're waiting on is just a regular Nova notification that anyone with the notification bus can wait on. We had some discussions about that in the forum. It's probably changing to be the um, select destinations notification. That's not been versioned objected yet. So when we do that, we can get the information in that we need. Hi. So uh, the question was, how do we expose storage to containers running on bare metal? Uh, so I didn't go into too many details on that. We're actually, one of the ways we're adding the Ceph storage in is we actually use Manila to manage the CephFS. So, and we've got basically Ansible scripts that scrape um, uh, Manila's API to actually get the mount point. So we're just doing a regular mount inside the bare metal instance um, to bring the storage in. And once you've got those mounts on your host system, it's just regular um, whatever your COE is. But it, I mean, right now we're targeting a Swarm more than Kubernetes, but both are supported. It's just a regular mount into your container as appropriate. Magnum's not involved in this, really, uh, in the current way we're doing it, at least. So the uh, big county down clock is almost going to the red light. So I think that's probably the end of the questions. But yeah, thank you everyone very much. Thank you. Thank you.